doesn't look like they have the AI summary. Oh, there it is, start summary, okay. The, uh, the app was just updated recently, so it was a little bit confusing. Okay, um, so this was the second untimely meditation, virtually the third thing that he had published. We began with the birth of tragedy and then went on to the first untimely meditation, which we have skipped. And um, we did Schopenhauer as educator earlier, and I think that will be um, uh, seen in a different light in, in the face of this particular essay on the uses and disadvantages of history for life. And the only background I think that is important is that history was not taught at the university level um, in the early 19th century. And they started to teach history. And that's what he is he means when he says that they're trying to turn history into a science. Um, that the universities were now teaching history. And that produced this essay. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I, I just want to know why you choose the Schopenhauer first, then choose uh, this one. And are you going to read another chapter on the uh, untimely, uh, un untimely uh, meditation? No, we're just going to do these two. We're going to skip Wagner okay. um, and Bayreuth. Um, the, I thought that Schopenhauer, as an educator, since it came after on the uses and disadvantages of history, was a better one to do because it was more by autobiographical. It was more about Nietzsche. And after reading The Birth of Tragedy, there was a lot of stuff in there that was autobiographical as well and less philosophical. And so that was why I chose Schopenhauer because then we get that out of the way. And now we sort of begin more philosophical work in this essay. So that, that was why I chose the way I did it. Um, Fred. I was surprised that you said that history wasn't taught in universities until the 19th century. Uh, because that's how people, for example, learn Greek was by reading Thucydides. Although that kind of makes sense now, because I don't know of of many historians or really any historians of the of the 18th century or 17th or 16th. I wonder why there is it just wasn't taught. Well, no, no, I think part of it is the whole idea of and I may be wrong about this, of, of universities was a relatively new phenomenon. And like they didn't, they had, you had tutors and you had stuff like that back in the Renaissance. They didn't have a university of Padua that, that all the Italian philosophers could go to in the Renaissance. And so somewhere along the line, they when philosophy became scientific post Descartes, that's when a body of um, coherent knowledge could be collected and and taught. And history was just had had not become a discipline yet. It, well, it had when Nietzsche was writing. I, when it became a, a uh, I tried to research that and couldn't find out when history was first taught in universities. But Nietzsche, having been an academic himself, was very familiar with the academic environment and just th thought that this is just a huge mistake, as clearly the essay uh, is developing at some length. So that's that's the best answer I can give to that one. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So I love the forward to this thing, um, let me let me make sure that I got this right before I go on any further. I think that's the part about the animals, right? Oh, no, 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 that's part one. He lays out what his whole purpose here is, is the intent, it's his, his intention to show why instruction without invigoration, why knowledge not attended by action 
why history has a costly superfluity and luxury must, to use Goethe's word, be seriously hated by us. Hated because we still lack even the things we need, and the superfluous is the enemy of the necessary. So he sort of sets the stage here for a certain amount of antagonism toward the whole idea of teaching history. And then the rest of the time is going to be developing why he thinks that. Um, I do not know what meaning classical studies could have for our time if they were not untimely. That is to say, acting counter to our time and thereby acting on our time and let us hope for the benefit of a time to come. So Nietzsche is always is looking for things that are, as the, the essay identifies, um, productive of life activity, of not just sitting around and acquire. And later on, he will actually explicitly say that knowledge for knowledge's sake um, is a huge mistake. You just get lost in, in the, and I think that that speaks to a condition that exists today as well. Um, university, uh, yeah, I don't know if you guys were all here for the earlier ones, but um, philosophy, Richard Rorty finally decided, should not be a discipline in a university either, because it's not something that you can just, you know, study. A philosophy is something that needs to be developed and lived. And so that's where, where Nietzsche is coming from. Um, so, does anybody have any, any comments on that at all? Okay, so in the very beginning, part one, I love this part about the animals and the unhistorical nature of their existence. And I've never forgotten that. I read this easily 40 years ago for the first time. And... And that just really, really stayed with me. It's a permanent now. There is no past. There is no future. And I find this useful as a, as a, a useful tool for me in terms of my own life, which is like everything in the past is over and done with. There's nothing I can do to change any of it. These are the kinds of thoughts that I had reflections on. And I think a really interesting observation, at least for me, was that um, when, okay, in the case of the smallest or the greatest happiness, however, it is always the same thing that makes happiness happiness. The ability to forget or expressed in more scholarly fashion, the capacity to feel unhistorically during its duration. And I think if you think about your own lives, you'll realize the truth of that statement. And I think that's a statement that's worth remembering. Uh, what do you guys think? Okay, so nobody's thinking anything. Oh, Jason. Yeah, um, I also like this one, but I try to save for the later part is about too much history caused the problem. You know, that's that's my personal feeling. And then uh, about the unhistorically, I probably I have get involved in the Buddhism thinking more. So I'm not that uh, surprised or this one because uh, I always know like live in the moment is one kind of pressure and then uh, coincidentally, uh, Nietzsche is talking about kind of same thing here. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was I. I just thought it was such an interesting point. Um, and a little further on, forgetting is essential to action of any kind. But just as not only light but darkness too is essential for the life of everything organic. It is altogether impossible to live at all without forgetting. And this is, a, this is a theme I think that underlies a lot of what this whole essay is about. Uh, Fred. Brought out by uh, a great short story by Borges, uh, Funes, the Memoriam, where he, he posits the existence of a, of a person, Funes, 
who has absolute photographic memory and every detail of everything that he perceives and how that's such a, a horrible burden to him. And one of the reasons is that he only knows particulars. He cannot generalize to abstractions or universals. And um, he may, and I think Nietzsche kind of makes this, the same point that it's, and, and actually Borges, in that short story, as I recall, he's, he says that that's why uh, forgetting is the most important part of learning. Because if you, for, if you ignore or forget details, that allows you to, it's basic to thinking. Thinking entails forgetting or ignoring de details in order to arrive at generalities, conceptions, which you can actually use and reason about. So I think that's an interesting counterpart to that. I have to say, I don't, I don't really like the notion, uh, fully agree anyway, with the notion that Nietzsche develops the paragraph earlier about animals living unhistorically and where it says it does not, animal does not know how to dissimulate. Animals are all about dissimulation. I mean, they do that all the time. Uh, there's uh, Batesian mimicry where, where non-poisonous butterflies uh, look like poisonous butterflies to avoid being eaten and angler fish. And um, animals just use dissimulation all the time in order to either uh, acquire prey or to avoid being prey. So that's a little odd. And animals often, um, birds and, and mammals in generally live historically in the sense of deriving their behavior from experience, learned from other animals. Now that doesn't carry from generation to generation, although even that's not true. Some animals do uh, carry uh, experience from generation to generation, but that's rare. But nevertheless, um, it seems to indicate that, that okay, animals, non-human animals, don't know how to dissimulate and by omission, humans specialize in dissimulation, whereas in fact, it's pretty common, I think. But nevertheless, I, the, the more important point is the one that you mentioned about, about forget, forgetting. And that, that's, that's a really interesting point. I think it's, it's uh, pertinent. Thanks. Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, um, a biological uh, development is a historical development, right? A, an evolutionary development. But I don't think Nietzsche is talking about that. I think Nietzsche is talking about when a bird flies somewhere, the bird generally is either escaping something or looking for food. It's not thinking like, well, let's see, yesterday, this was a really fun flight I took over this building over here. It's not doing that. It's just doing things. It's just moving along through its life. It has no concept that there's a future coming at him that might be reflective of the past that they've already had. I think he's making a specific point here about the conscious or, or uh, active movement is driven unhistorically. That none of it, that may be learned behavior, but I don't think Nietzsche's really delving into that. I think he's trying to show the difference between the cow in the field who doesn't seem to do anything and is happy, relatively speaking, all the time because it has no past that it's aware of. That's that's what I think he's trying to do. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? It would be nice if you did. <laughs> okay. All righty. Uh, I can see we might be better off as humans. No, Jason, 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 raise your, raise your virtual hand, please. That's kind of the rule. Makes it oh. a lot easier if you don't interrupt each other. Here, yeah, just my hand. Yeah, there's a here, and I'm calling on you. Jason, you raised your hand. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that one of the problems with 19th century philosophers, they don't fully understand DNA and genetics. And, you know, we look, we now know that, yeah, animals do a lot of things, even though it's not very conscious, they're not really planning things. There's a kind of genetic development that goes through. 
the way animals behave. And Nietzsche just doesn't understand this. It doesn't come up in, maybe vaguely it comes up, but he doesn't really quite understand that concept. Well, I think for his purposes, see, I, I find myself in agreement with him. I, I imagine myself being, uh, I, I don't really imagine myself doing this, but I took care of uh, my daughter's dog for a little while. And the dog would enjoy doing exactly the same thing over and over and over again and never tire of playing with a tug toy ever. And then it would get tired and go sleep. So that to me was like, it, it forgot that it already played with it. it, it, it he had forgotten that maybe the tug toy is really boring. Get me a ball, you know, that kind of thing. I don't think the genetic aspect is has really. I, I don't think what we know today um, um, spoils the observation. Jason. Yeah, first I agree with you on the dog experience. You know, basics they are untimely, so <laughs> they don't know. You know, they just. Yeah. So sometimes I feel like my dog will be happy twice a day because every time to walk. But I kind of ask myself, am I t happy twice a day? I should be at least better than my dog, right? I should be at least happy or excited twice a day. So uh, I think that's a great goal. And secondly, I agree with uh, Fred talking about forgetfulness. I think that's probably more important than remembering because we all, when we age, we all complain about forgetting. But we forget one thing important. There's something we want to forget. We can't. Okay. So I think that's uh, worthwhile to think. But another important thing I want to ask Lindsay is, I'm still thinking about you talk about history not taught in German university. But I believe this essay, uh, when Nietzsche wrote it, I think he has Hegel in his mind. And Hegel famously taught a uh, history of philosophy in university. So that's the question I have. So, uh... yeah, I, I, that's a good guess. I, I think you're guessing that that might be the origin of the whole no notion of history being a, a university discipline. And I, I think you might be right. I think that that might be the actual origin of the whole thing. The way the way that Hegel, um, you know, produced the I forget what the word was, the whole notion of progress that everything's building up to a higher form. Martin. Uh, yeah. So back to that point you're making about like animals and like um, with Thomas Aquinas, he felt the, uh, there was some sort of like collective conscious. Uh, with a lot of animals, uh, there could have been some religious overtone with that. Um, but yeah, I was thinking about like ants colonies, how they have like a like a hive mind mentality, or certain whales they follow certain uh, grid systems in the waters, right? So maybe there is a collective conscious, who knows? Uh, but it seems like they're they're in sync with each other in some way. Yeah, I still well, I, I'm still contend though that there, there's no sense of the past. It's a okay. it's a permanent present. It's always now for them. Okay. And an right. example I would give of people, and I, I'm almost positive we all know people who have done this. Something has happened in their lives, and their lives have stopped, especially like the death of a husband or the death of a loved one of any sort at all. Right. I knew in um, many, many years ago, who her boyfriend, the, who she, he was living with her at the time, he died and she turned her house into a mausoleum. She didn't throw anything away. She didn't move on at all because she couldn't forget. She right. couldn't let it go. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the kind of thing that I think he's sort of suggesting here in the beginning, at least opening up, up to that in order to to do something, you have to forget certain things that may stop you from doing that thing. And so forgetting it in that sense is, is sort of vital to the action. Um, Fred. 
No, for sure. You know, there's the, the Buddha's the Buddha's question, uh, do, do dogs have Buddha nature? And it seems to me the, the answer is, of course, dogs have Buddha nature because they live in the moment. The question should be, can humans, unlike dogs, achieve Buddha nature and live in the moment? Well, okay, I don't think that's what Nietzsche is suggesting, but that's a, certainly an interesting thought. <laughs> okay, so here, there it is, or to express my theme even more simply, there is a degree of sleeplessness, of rumination, of the historical sense, which is harmful and ultimately fatal to the living thing, whether this living thing be a man or a people or a culture. And this is a big concern of his, and possibly for his entire life, his, his culture. And he comes closer to identifying what he means by culture somewhere in here. I've got it highlighted, but I'm not sure where it's at. Um, which it, it, it's, a, it's such an easy word to throw around, and it's such a hard word to get a grasp on of what he means. Um, Let's see. So here's a, here's another one. Um, the unhistorical and the historical are necessary in equal measure for the health of an individual, of a people, and a culture. And health is an interesting thing to consider because this physiological notion of of culture and uh, a morality is all going to come into play later on. So it's sort of important to just be aware of what he's saying here. Um, so what he does then is he identifies three different types of history. Monumental, let me see my notes here. Monumental, antiquarian, and critical. So the second section is about um, monumental history, what its virtues are and what its risks are. The third section is about uh, antiquarian history. And the fourth section is about critical history. And then begins the attack <laughs> on the universities. Um, so a good example, and this was another thing that I thought was fortuitous of monument. Can, well, before I do that, do any of you have uh, um, an idea of what monumental history is, what he means, what he thinks is a virtuous form of monumental history? Jason. I I, I think he's talking about like Napoleon, okay, or typical history hero, okay, that, that, and the weekend model. That, that's what I think, you know, I'm not sure, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's something like that. I think that Schopenhauer as educator is an example of monumental history. And the, just the title, not Schopenhauer as my idol to worship forever and the rest of my life, but as my educator. And I know for a long time in classical studies, Plutarch's Lives was a book that was almost required reading because they set examples of what a human being could be in a given lifetime, Fred. I get the sense that monumental here is more merely consolatory, that in, in the same way that we might go visit a monument, say the Parthenon and say, oh, that's nice, look at that. That's amazing that the Romans did that. What do we do now? You know, it doesn't become really part of you. You're kind of paying homage to it. And uh, you, you need to get into the other two forms before it becomes really a part of you and and uh, and um, helps you engage in actual actions in, in your own life. Um, yeah, I don't think that he's actually literally means monuments. So that's why I, I suggested that Schopenhauer's educator is a good example of picking out people in the past, people in the past, <clears throat> who, who show how um, great people can be, how far they can reach, how much they can accomplish in a lifetime, and to use them as examples 
for your own life. <clears throat> and the risk is to idolize them instead and, and to forget everybody else that might be great as well. And so monumental history would, would sort of study the highlights of human history. Jason. Yeah, the, I, I, like, I, I think we have the same page number, page 69, right? I think he, in the middle, he talked about uh, the monumentalistic concept, conception of the past, engagement with classic and the real earlier time. So uh, to the man of the present, he learned from it the greatness that once exists wa was in any event once possible and may this be possible again. So he's talking about they can do this. So it may happen to me. So I think to, that's why I'm talking about is more uh, heroic, okay, uh, uh, history, okay. And then the next page, he started to talk about Stoic again and Epicurean, Caesar, you know, and uh, I do, Oh, because I unfortunately I read Nietzsche start from Zarathustra. Okay, so uh, I find out a lot of words he used here, a lot of concept here. Okay, it's you can see how they begin it. here. He's talking about eternal return to me. Okay, and the priest page. Okay, he also talked about the complain about the present as a grave digger. Okay, so that's the common words used in Zarathustra. So I find out, you know, a lot of uh, reading, a lot of uh, Nietzsche's early texts, it really helped for the future, okay, texts, yeah, yeah so. Yeah, I was surprised when I started reading this, how much really early thinking it developed a lot over the years, but there's an awful lot of of early formulations of things that were important to him that show up in these early writings. And that that um, that thing you just mentioned about the return of return, I was so surprised when I ran across that. Um, I'm I'm on page sixty nine. Is is that where you were? Yeah, you, know, you were just reading, I think. And it's the uh, um, next to the last paragraph on that page. The greatness that once existed was in any event once possible and may thus be possible again. He goes his way with more cheerful step for the doubt which assailed him in weaker moments, whether he was not perhaps desiring the impossible has now been banished. And I think that's what he's saying is, is one of the virtues of monumental history. And that kind of history is worth pursuing. Um, just cramming all of it together is dangerous and risky because you you don't have that monumental perspective. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, that's on page 70. That's in the text that I supplied you. That which was once possible could present itself as a possibility for a second time only if the Pythagoreans were right in believing that when the constellation of the heavenly bodies is repeated, the same things down to the smallest event must also be repeated on earth. So that whenever the stars stand in a certain relation to one another, a Stoic again joins with an Epicurean to murder Caesar. And when they stand in another relation, Columbus will again discover America. Is that the part you just read? Am I just reading it over again? <laughs> that sounds like it. Yeah, okay. All right, I think that's, that's a really important thing to just note that that is existing in this essay. Jason. Yeah, I, I was wondering about the motivation that he has while he's telling us this. I, and I think it's, this is just my opinion. You, no one has to agree to it. I think he's trying to counter Kant and this idea of reason and the moral law. And these discussions are about trying to locate the will in a way that we we understand it originally as maybe we're against what someone's doing like an evil tyrant is doing something but then later we agree well wait a minute that may be the right thing to do 
there's a it seems like a little confusing but in the long run we have a different opinion about how things happen in history then than he does you mean i don't think he has a, a feeling necessarily about um i think that's what he's fighting against that that um a lot of things happen in history and you need to just sort of sort through them i i i would be hard pressed to agree with you about kant and there's no expression of schopenhauer going on in here that i that i could recognize so you you can go ahead and think all about, but uh, you're bringing that. I think you're bringing that into the essay. I don't think it's actually in the essay at all. Um, Nick, I kind of want to go back uh, a few pages back and hover a little bit longer uh, in the part where he talks about the historical man versus the supra historical man. That's a uh, the supra-historical man is just at the top of page 66. This is the man whereby uh, uh, maybe I should just read it. Uh, yeah, go, go read it. But, it's all, it's all, yeah, but, our, but our question can also be answered differently. Again, with a no, but with a no for a different reason with a no of the supra-historical man who sees no salvation in the process, for whom rather the world is complete and reaches its finality at each and every moment. What could 10 more years teach that the past 10 were unable to teach? As opposed to the historical man, which is the paragraph before, uh, the historical man believed that the meaning of existence will come more and more to light in the course of its process. And they glance behind them only so that from these process so far, they can learn to understand the present and to desire the future more vehemently. They have no idea that despite their preoccupation with history, they in fact and act unhistorically, or that their occupation with history stands in service, not of pure knowledge, but of Lie, which is, I think, he. This is the part that he. This, this is what the essay is about. The historical man who should live, who should, who should uh, study history for the purpose of life uh, rather than knowledge. But then the supra-historical man is also interesting to me. It, and 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 this supra-historical man is because if you read down there, he talks about. Uh, Giacomo Leopardi, who quotes a passage that is reminiscent of Schopenhauer. Nothing lives that is worth thee, thy agitation in the earth deserves that a sigh. Our being is pain and boredom when the world is dirt. Nothing more be calm, which is Schopenhauerish in outlook. And, and yeah. it talks not about history, but about uh, uh, being kind of uh, yeah, almost in the moment, just be calm and Take all of this in stride, the pain and the board. And, uh, anyway, I thought that was worth stopping for a little while. Yeah, that uh, the next paragraph starts off, though, but let us leave the supra-historical men to their nausea and their yeah. wisdom. Today, let us rejoice for what's in our unwisdom. And so he's sort of saying like that, that is a terrible way to be, where you, there is no motivation to action, to be alive anymore, to do anything in particular, because it's either already been done or it won't change anything. I, I think this in a lot of different situations that... You know, okay, so I made a big mistake there in a hundred years. Nobody will even know I was alive on the planet Earth. That, but I still do stuff. But this is this is of course a, a bit of an exaggeration. The super historical man who is trapped in his own wisdom and and probably correct ob observation. But that's what Nietzsche is sort of condemning. That even if it may be correct, it's not conducive to life. And so we need to break out of that mode and use the proper balance of monumental, antiquarian, and critical 
history. Jason. You're muted, Jason. Sorry, since we are talking about this page, I, I do have a question here. You know, he used the nausea. Okay, that does have the uh, super supra historical mental. They are nausea and they are wisdom. How do we understand nausea here? You know, I, I my understand is I'm not sure. I just tried because if you overeat, okay, then you feel nausea. So if you read too much history, you feel nausea. That, that's what I see, but I don't know. You know what would be the another way to understand this word? You know. Well, I think that's one of the what that comes right out of the birth of tragedy, where when you see, you go into a tragedy with the, the visible culture around you and everybody's wearing satin and all the rest of it. And then you engage in the tragic experience where the wisdom of Silenus is revealed to you, which is better not to have been born at all because at bottom nature is cruel, ignorant, doesn't, you know, there is no control, there's no nothing. And so when you return back with this knowledge, you look around with a sense of nausea at what we were pretending is the way life ought to be. That's that's what I think he did in The Birth of Tragedy. And that's the nausea that I think he's referring to there. That, that wisdom, that kind of wisdom, an awareness that you know nature is red and tooth and claw and life is nasty, brutish, and sure, without all the cultural trappings. But that is the fundamental ground of it all. And the nausea arises when you really realize that. You look around at, at a lot of things a lot differently once you think that way. So that's what I think he's trying to say is this is this is not not a good thing. This is a bad thing. And why didn't he use a disgusting something like this? And no, it's 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 a it, well nausea. It may be a, a mistranslation or something. I I don't really know, but it's kind of a sickness. Let's call it. Let's call it that. A sickness at you suddenly see through all the illusion around you, and you understand that it's all pretense. It's all games we're playing. We've built the structure around us, and it could be almost anything else at all. This what I thought was real life isn't. And that's a bad thing to do for life, for life, to move, to be motivated and to move on. Okay. So in section two, he goes into uh, monumental, which I think we've kind of, I, I hope we're all in agreement on that. Um, So the next one is antiquarian here. He's, this is at the very end of section two on page 72. <clears throat> Much mischief is caused through the thoughtless transplantation of these plants. I probably should read something a little earlier. Each of the three species of history which exists belongs to a certain soil and a certain climate and only to that. In any other, it grows into a devastating weed. If the man who wants to do something great has need of the past at all, he approaches it by means of monumental history. Think Schopenhauer as educator. He, on the other hand, who likes to persist in the familiar and the revered of old, tends the past as an antiquarian historian. And only he who is oppressed by a present need and who wants to throw off this burden as, at any cost has need of critical history. That is to say, a history that judges and condemns. Much mischief is caused through the thoughtless transplantation of these plants. The critic without need, the antiquarian without piety, the man who recognizes greatness but cannot himself do great things are such plants estranged from their mother soil and degenerated into weeds. So in section three, takes on antiquarian or describes antiquarian history. 
And then the second looks like the second sentence. By tending with care that which has existed from of old, he wants the antiquarian, he wants to preserve for those who shall come into existence after him the conditions under which he himself came into existence, and thus he serves life. And this becomes dangerous when you insist that this past thing is the way things ought to be forever. And I know people whose lives have virtually stopped in 1950. Um, I've, got, I've got a friend that I walk with in the morning, and he collects all kinds of memorabilia and stuff from the 50s and 60s, paperback books, um, um, records, old records. He he doesn't do anything in the modern world at all, and so his his activity in a modern sense is stifled because he has latched onto that period as something special and wonderful. and And I think that is 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 a sense of this of of an overwrought antiquarian historical approach, Jason. At some point, he calls that decadence. Anyone who tries to look to the past for, you know, justification for their behavior. I don't know which book that is, but I mean, he, after the birth of tragedy, it seems to me that Nietzsche begins to uh, disagree with Wagner. He, he doesn't want the past to be some kind of uh, guide to people's behavior. So I'm not sure if this this book I think is trying to break away from the birth of tragedy in some extent. Well, if you take the birth of tragedy as the as the complete thing, we only did the first fifteen chapters, which was the way it was published in the, at the very first time, and then the whole latter sections all about Wagner uh, were added later. And and you may be right about that. We did we didn't read that. Um, I think he's extending thoughts. I'm, I'm not sure that he's really changing very much. Uh, Fred? I think he has a nice summary of it here on page one, on page 75, when he says that uh, the one who is immersed in antiquarian history and knows how to preserve life, but not how to engender it and preserve life here, I, I take it means preserve life as it was. Yeah. To, yeah. So, so I, I think that's that pretty much summarizes what, what the problem is here. And Nietzsche is about engendering life. The, the rest of that sentence after the semicolon, it always undervalues that which is becoming because it has no instinct for divining it as monumental history, for example, has. So he's finding, he's trying to point out what the, <coughs> excuse me, what the risks of antiquarian history are. <clears throat> and this is one you ossify, you ossify. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a bit of a cough here. <clears throat> um, let's see, a little bit further on, it requires a great deal of strength to be able to live and to forget the extent to which to live and to be unjust is one and the same thing. It wants to be clear as to how unjust the existence of anything, and this is antiquarian history, a privilege, a caste, a dynasty, for example, is and how greatly this thing deserves to perish. Then its past is regarded critically. Then one takes the knife to its roots. Then one cruelly tramples over every kind of piety. So, <clears throat> sorry. Since we are the outcome of earlier generations, this is on page 76, we are also the outcome of their aberrations, passions, and errors, and indeed of their crimes. It is not possible wholly to free oneself from this chain. If we condemn these aberrations and regard ourselves as free of them, this does not alter the fact that we originate in them. This is a concept that will be reflective of in, uh, down the road, and especially in the genealogy of morals, this whole notion. 
um, that a lot of the things that you might venerate in the past, there's a lot of evil back there too. It isn't just the good stuff. And sometimes what we would think of as evil actually produced the good or what we consider the good later on. Uh, any more thoughts on the antiquarian historian? Jason. Yeah, I very much like on the page, on the top of page uh, 76. Okay, he talked about bring it before the tribunal, uh, scrupulously examining it and finally condemning it. Every pass is worthy to be condemned. I think that's that's a good attitude. Okay, and but it seems conflict with what he said uh, at the beginning of chapter three. He talked about history does belong in the second place to him who preserve and the reverse a uh, 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 reveal right. So, but on the page seventy six, he talk about. Pandemic. So it seems a little bit conflicts, right? Yeah, well, I think if you read, well, I'm not accusing you of not reading terribly. I think that what he's he's setting up the original um, thought oh. of the has a certain amount of, of respect for the past, but okay. not a just, be yeah. there. And okay. then he should how this, at the antiquarian sense, of reflections on the past can be dangerous and stupid. Okay, yeah. Because, because you, you don't have that, that attitude toward them uh, of being able to learn something from it. Uh, Nick? Yeah, I'm just trying to uh, extract from the readings so far the part where... Uh, where these approaches, these three uh, approaches to history, uh, of studying yes. history or looking at history, uh, can serve life. It's supposed to serve life. I mean, it can be done to serve knowledge, which will, I think, uh, is the wrong path, he's saying. But but these are, can all be done in, in, in a profitable way to serve life. But I... Um, is he going to talk that uh, about that at some point, or does he not talk about it uh, as, uh, as he discusses each approach, like uh, the monumental and the uh, antiquarian? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Well, but... I'm asking for how to how to do these uh, be uh, to study history in a monumental way to serve life. Because that is what is his intent. Is this had to serve life well, else? It is. It is. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm kind of trying to find. Maybe I just missed it as I'm reading this. It's, I don't it's the, monumental, the monumental history, and, 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 like antiquarian history, would, would probably it, like Schopenhauer is educated, right? Would would uh, take a look at the actual history of Schopenhauer as a human being. And that's what he does in Schopenhauer as educator. So that's an example, both I, I think of not genuinely antiquarian, but certainly before Nietzsche was born, about how Schopenhauer, this man he holds in very high esteem, but is willing to disagree with, but still holds up as an example of, of a man who, who brought a lot of originality to life and lived a life that reflected his philosophy. And the antiquarian approach to that would be that whole section about how he was raised, how Schopenhauer was raised. And you just look at that to sort of see where the example is. How did this man come to be? Maybe this will be useful in the future to produce another Schopenhauer. And he's, th he's thinking of himself as, as a pretty smart guy too, <laughs> along the way. So, so you know, he's not not in the picture here. Uh, Jason. Oh, okay, well, maybe I'll get this one right. Um, I've read <laughs> I read these books. I've read them out of order, so I'm just like trying to figure out where is he getting this from? Where is he in time? And I think monumental would 
point to his argument about Napoleon. When Napoleon was active, running through Europe with his armies, changing countries into republics and enforcing the rights of man, he's monumental. And, but many people thought of him as an evil tyrant and that he's not a good example to point to in terms of history. But as time goes on, he's then revered because he did, Napoleon did use that, that uh, tyranny to create the new Europe. But I'm not sure if that's what he's referring to here. Yeah, well, he's not referring to it specifically, I don't think. But I, I think that's in completely the idea that he's sort of getting at, that the difficulty the, or the problem for the monumental historian and the, 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 per, the correct, the, not the correct, but the best way to do it is to have a mixture of all three. And this will be developed by the end of the essay so that you are both antiquarian and not both. You're all antiquarian, monumental, and critical in your approach to history, generally. And and so a lot of those things can be said about Napoleon, but there's a general consensus that, that Napoleon was one of the, the highlights of human beings on the planet, that uh, he did some of the most extraordinary things, and a lot of good things did come out of it, but you have to be aware of all the bad things that were there, too. And just to be aware, not don't do don't put him on a pedestal and imagine that that this is what everybody ought to try to be. You, you know what I mean, Jason? Yeah, but I also read that he praises evil tyrants. He said, "Well, they may be evil at that yeah, time." No, okay. And, okay. He doesn't do that in this essay. We okay. are doing. It's 1874 here for the for 12 more minutes. And we don't know what he is going to be writing. And that's why we're starting at the beginning and working our way through. So we can see how some of these early thoughts will, will stay with him. And some of them he's just going to overthrow completely when he gets older. Oh, yeah. It definitely changes yeah. over time. Oh, yeah, yeah, totally, totally, yeah, yeah. And that's one of the, what I think, one of the virtues of, of Nietzsche. And it's also one of the things that confused a lot of people about, is he a philosopher or not? Because he's, you know, not like Kant or Hegel. He's got no system here. And at the time, without a system, you weren't a philosopher. And so Nietzsche broke ground in terms of what philosophy could be um in 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 a very modern sense um anyway and so we're, we're just keeping up with his development from the beginning once we finish this essay we're going to start the gay science and we're going to go through that aphorism by aphorism so we're going to go through the whole thing i don't know how long that's going to take we'll experiment with that when we get to it but that is the beginning of what walter kaufman thinks is his mature philosophy so, so here we're just sort of exploring and testing our own sense of, do we agree with this or do we not agree with this? And I, I think that for myself, I think when we get to the end of this, I think maybe all of you have read the whole thing. He's got a very um, um, reasonable and responsible approach to history. And the attack on the universities, which we'll get to, I don't know if we're going to actually get to it today. Um, is as pertinent today as it was when he made it. So let's move on to critical. <clears throat> so the opening uh, paragraph of section four is, um, these are the services history is capable of performing. Oh, well, actually, wait, he, ta he takes on critical I don't know, if I'm, and critical, wants to be clear as to how unjust and privilege. Yeah, I already read that part. So we've already been introduced to um, the, the critical sense of, of history, where you have to be aware of the bad stuff as well as the good stuff. You can't just ignore um, the bad stuff and pretend that the good stuff tells the whole story. So there are the services history is capable of performing for life. Every man and every nation requires in accordance with its goals, 
energies, and needs, a certain kind of knowledge of the past, now in the form of monumental, now of antiquarian, now of critical history. But it does not require it as a host of pure thinkers who only look on at life of knowledge thirsty individuals whom knowledge alone will satisfy and to whom the accumulation of knowledge is itself the goal but always and only for the ends of life and thus also under the domination and supreme direction of these ends. So I think chapter uh, section four here is um, his first opening shot on the notion of history as a science. And what he means by that is a university discipline because the sciences had been incorporated into the university. And this is, I felt really powerful. I've, I've got some friends that are in academia. I've got a friend who's just getting out of academia. And um, it's, it, it's so much of this seems true. And here he, be, he begins to also reveal what he thinks about culture. And this so I highlighted. Um, on page 79, at the very bottom, the last sentence of that paragraph, the culture of the people as the antithesis. Well, wait, I should do the barbarism thing earlier. Oh, yeah, okay. It's in the middle. If a present day man were magically transported back to that world of the Greeks, he would probably consider the Greeks very uncultured. Whereby, to be sure, the secret of modern culture, so scrupulously hidden, would be exposed to public ridicule. For we moderns have nothing whatever of our own, only by replenishing and cramming ourselves with the ages, customs, arts, philosophies, religions, discoveries of others, do we become anything worthy of notice, that is to say, walking encyclopedias, which is what an ancient Greek transported into our own time would perhaps take us for. With encyclopedias, however, all the value lies in what is contained within, in the content, not in what stands without the binding and cover. So it is that the whole culture, the whole of modern culture is essentially inward. On the outside, the bookbinder has printed some such things as handbook of inward culture for outer barbarians. So this is where he's identifying uh, culturally um, he's trying to get at what I what I think he thinks culture means, Brad. It seems to be move beyond a, a critique of historicism to a more a broader critique of education in the modern era and culture in the modern era. And and on page seventy eight, where he has uh, this somewhat poetic uh, phrase, modern man drags around with him a huge quantity of indigestible stones of knowledge. And he goes on to say, as you remarked, the antithesis between an interior which fails to correspond to any exterior, exterior which fails to correspond to any interior. And this is a, a, seems like a more pointed, maybe I'm reading into this, more pointed criticism of the modern era in general, not just as it relates to history, um, which is actually pertinent today, it seems. Yeah. I read that uh, a large percentage, I think it was 40% of uh, graduates uh, today in uh, liberal arts uh, do not use anything that they learned in their current occupation five years later. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you're right. That's actually what's going on here. He's, he's opening, this is the firing shot uh, across the bow of modern culture. And the modernity is not lost. Uh, how far are we away from this 150 years later? This is still a reflection of, of when I, my own personal knowledge of a lot of at least academia. I was not part of academia, but I've known people who are part of it, and I did go to college for a while, and I'm familiar, I've talked to some of the teachers, and I'm familiar with a lot of this uh, uh, wheel spinning that goes on, and there's a, and so that's, that's what he's 
trying to show is that there is no culture in Germany. And, and I, I, I thought this would be an interesting thought about today because we have no American culture either. It's just a it's just a big piggy mess of individual styles and individual identities and individual political opinions and individual tastes. And if anything, we're even further away from having a culture, the more individualized um, media becomes because they're the culture in the in his sense is a continuity of artistic style. And it's kind of hard to sort out what, what does that mean exactly? But, um, and I, I'm not gonna even speculate on that at the moment, um, that's, but that's what he provides us the definition and that will come back later on. Uh, Jason. So when, when you did, you talk about, but for some reason I'm reading a little bit different way. You talk about the, he, he, okay, in your opinion, Nietzsche is, think the German has no culture, he want to have a culture? Is that what he want? Yeah, he thinks that Germany has just borrowed cultural, has appropriated other cultures instead of creating its own. So that's where he's got that whole thing about how, you know, we're, we're, we're wearing clothes that are designed by French people. So and when he, talking about working in encyclopedias. He's talking about culture? I think he is in, in that particular spot. That, that, but, but I think academia is involved in that as well. Just this, this whole notion that of knowledge for knowledge's sake, not knowledge because we really need some of this information to, so, to move on. I, I might read it differently. I think he talked about working in encyclopedia. He's complaining people holding the knowledge and not thinking. Okay. So yeah. that's what I and the reason is if you go to the previous page, page 78, uh at the beginning, first paragraph, he talked about let us now picture the spiritual occurrence introduced into soul of modern man by which we have just described. Okay. Uh I think he is talking about Hegel. Okay. <laughs> I, at least I read this way. I think he's talking about Hegel. So uh, he complained about the spiritual of the history. I, I, I'm talking about that's what I understand. Okay. So uh, I think that's why I don't see he talk about culture. I think he talk about spiritual of history. Okay, so anyway, that, that's what I read, but I'm, I'm not sure. I just want to share with you, which is different than what you talk about. Yeah. Okay, well, this, yeah, this particular section, I wrote down a little thing here, form and content. And, then, and what he's trying to say is that, that the German public is all content and no form. There is no culture springing from all the knowledge that's piled up in their heads. They're not doing anything to create a, set, a cultural world. Art is being borrowed even from, from other, other countries. This is very nationalistic, I suppose, at some level you could sort of say this, but but um, um, <clears throat> I, found, I found this particularly per pertinent today as well. There is no American culture. There's a lot of knowledge. Everybody's got the world at their fingertips on their phones. They don't even need to have it inside anymore. But there's no there's no form, and and I'm not sure that I think that's important. That's that I'm not sure quite what to do. I don't know if I agree with Nietzsche. Let me put it that way: that this is an important thing. I try to keep it as individual as possible. But here in these early days, he's reaching out and and trying to show that that. <clears throat> Like he, like the French, the way he's looking at it, have a culture, and they they create original things based on their Frenchness, whatever that might be, like the clothing that he mentioned specifically, and the Germans have none of that. They import everything, 
I mean, they may have all this knowledge in their head, but there isn't anything that you can look at and go, this is a German thing. That's sort of what he is feeling. And I don't know if he's right or wrong, because I was around now. <laughs> uh, Nick. Yeah, I kind of wanted to bring us uh, back uh, just a, maybe a sentence before uh, the place that uh, uh, Jason Peng just read. Uh, and, and that's when he talks about uh, about the move of the German move towards science, I guess, yes. embrace of science and science, science, which he says uh, in, in uh, by science, by the demand of history, should be a science. On page seven, now the demand of life alone no longer reigns and exercise constraint on knowledge of the past. And when that happens, he talks about this motto, the dangerous motto of uh, fiat veritas periat vita. Let truth prevail, though life perish. So, so here, truth is is put above life or and 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 uh, each he wants to you know uh he's, he's against that because for him life is more important than than that i mean th this is all done for the purpose of life and 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 so he wants to put things in perspective i thought that was a good uh, a, a good th but then he starts moving very quickly into the internal Internal is the internal versus versus form, as you say, as, as something that is just uh, absorbed inside, but there's no uh, no form that no external form that that emanates from it. Uh, so um, that is where I guess we were uh, talking about uh, all this knowledge that's inside and not uh, it may be actualized. It is it isn't really German. Because it isn't maybe it's French or whatever the term, but but not not yet German or not not externalized. Anyways, there's there's a lot of movement here, so I I just wanted to kind of pull back a little bit because I'm still kind of focusing on, in on the idea of of life uh, being the determinant or 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 the the main purpose for the, for the learning of history. That's all. Yeah. The the. I think what's important here is just the idea that life is is almost the most important thing to him. A life, like an intellectual life, it's not like ants being alive, right? Or cows in the field. It's human beings having living lives of some value and some importance. And that's that's what he's trying to pursue and and here this the other thing is this these are early essays and he he resorts in the end right after this the untimely meditations to the first books of aphorisms and these are just individual thoughts that are that are thrown out there there is connection there is a certain amount of continuity to it but it's not like the essay the essay form was not his best um method because he tends to get distracted and he tends to to drift off and get very polemical when it may not be called for to make a point. And, and so these these are are they're not really immature works. I couldn't do this stuff, but they're immature compared to his later work. And so that's that's why there may appear to be some contradictions along the way. But the idea of life, this was in the birth of tragedy as well that life was what was important, a life that's, that's productive and creative. Um, so, I'm kind of where we're at. So, section five begins. So I'm just going to read this first paragraph and then uh, we'll set up for the next time around. The oversaturation, this is on page uh, 83. <laughs> The over, I'm sorry, the oversaturation of an age with history. And, and this is, again, this is a reflection of the notion that, that history was now going to be a university discipline. And what he's criticized along the way is that 
you, you just collect a lot of history as, as for its own sake. You don't you don't try to necessarily relate it all. It's this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and that's what he's. I, mean, I think being critical of it may not have been that way, but I'm not sure. The oversaturation of an age with history seems to me to be hostile and dangerous to life in five respects. Such an excess creates that contrast between inner and outer, which we have just discussed, and thereby weakens the personality. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm going to stop there. The, um, the rest will will introduce us to the rest of the essay. These are all the things he's going to be dealing with. Damn, I thought I was over this, but maybe I'm not. <clears throat> um, so anybody have any wrapped up wrap up thoughts here? The rest of the essay is going to clarify why the way history is being assembled is bad or being taught or being thought of. And he's going to finish the argument against this. And there's a lot of stuff that's going to come in along the way that will reflect on things he writes later. So I kind Jason. of, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we. I I think the, the, uh, this essay uh, Nietzsche make a good structure, so it's easier to read because from one to four is talking about three uh, mode or three attitude of history, and the five to ten is talking about five different problem or uh, about assess uh, or over situation of history, something like this. So I think probably that's a good break. Done. Well, uh, yeah, it was very serendipitous. I thought that, that it was that was a, it was a fairly good break, just cut it in half that way. And so we'll kind of wrap up his last thoughts. And for then when I was well, it, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of people who have been here from the beginning. Because I was thinking that it would be fun to just have a, a section where we could just reflect on what we have read so far, which is just three things, but um, we don't have enough people that have been here from the very beginning. So I'm, I'm probably going to skip that and we'll just go into uh, gay science. So you want to go to gay science next week or you want to kind of finish no, we're it? Doing the, we're doing it, the rest of, of this essay next week and then we're going to start the gay science. Yeah, gay science will be have more people because I I think that these two you know I actually I think it's Schopenhauer okay and especially this one I really like it okay but unfortunately without you I probably would never never read this one well, yeah I thought I thought of that too um, yeah it's uh, not famous at all I don't know at least it's, to me I totally unknown I say why didn't he choose this one it's. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Kaufman thinks these are important essays, these two. And so I'm I'm just following his lead in a way. And uh, I think they are important essays in terms of seeing what some of his early thought is and getting a sense of who he is. And that's where Schopenhauer as educator, I think, is really, really important. And and so we're we're trying to approach the man as a human being and a philosopher as well. I am anyway. That's sort of how I'm trying to deal with this. And, um, well, most, yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on that note, I'm kind of curious myself. The, the way, uh, why is he hung up on history at at this point? Why, why so interested? And and, and Jason's kind of said a couple of times that perhaps it's in reaction to Hegel. Uh, and, uh, but I, I, you know, I mean, is, is there? Uh, do we know? Does anybody know why? Why hang up on? history as uh and the uses well, of history. He was writing these essays. They were collected as untimely meditations. And so that that uh, he was arguing against the establishment of history as a new discipline in the universities. And I'm I would I'm confident that that Hegel's philosophy is playing a role here. And this is a reaction to Hegel even if he is not being specifically critical of Hegel. But the concept of history that Hegel developed, he's definitely being a critic of. 
and and so that that could be the background of this um for my two cents worth generally i'm just taking it as if he just uh, i just read it and i i I do know some of that other stuff. I'm glad you brought that up, though, Jason. I thought I think that was important. Um, so I, I know what I know about Kant, and I know what I know about Hegel. I didn't think of that specifically because it's been a long time since I read it in Hegel. Uh, but but that may be exactly what what he's after here. So we'll bear that in mind. Any of his predecessors are are fair game. Um, and he will directly attack some of them down the road. Or disagree with, maybe I should say. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys for being here. And and Jason, I didn't I mean, I, I think it was you who, who I was sort of arguing with a little bit. I'm just offering my own opinion about a lot of that stuff. I'm not okay. trying to say it's necessarily wrong because I'm not, I don't think I have any kind of authority to do that. But I, I'm just offering um, my opinion, and so I, I hope you will come back. Yeah, so, we will find out. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next week is going to be the rest of this essay, and um, then we will be moving on to the gay science, or the joyful wisdom, as some people translate it as. All right. All right. Okay. See you. See ya. Thank you, guys.